I hope that today you will come out of the seminar knowing, first of all, how you can be eligible for Express Entry, second, how you can improve your score, and third, you'll know a lot about what you can do to avoid refusals. So what does your file need to have so that you have success in the end, right? Uh, I'm going to ask you to keep all the questions related to Express Entry. So if you have questions about uh, some other provincial nomination programs, please keep them towards the end. At the end, I'll announce um, what options you have in terms of having a free consultation with our company as well. All right. And uh, before I start, I have a couple questions for you. So how many of you here have calculated the Express Entry score before? OK, so a lot of you, good. And how many of you guys here have outside Canada work experience in education? A lot of you, all right, good. Um, that helps. Um, a lot of you will learn today that you might already be eligible for Express Entry even though you don't have one-year work experience. So that's one thing that a lot of people take out of the seminar usually. Um, all right, so a few words about Express Entry. Express Entry is still fairly a new system. It's been three years since it was launched. Um, government is still adjusting it, testing it. It's not perfect. Portal doesn't always function well. Um, but um, it's been three years, right? So we, we do have a lot of good statistics about it now. Not like in the beginning we couldn't predict anything. Now we can make some predictions, so that's great. And uh, if you guys know, before 2015 January, before Express Entry was, uh, before Express Entry was launched, the way immigration looked like was uh, was like this. So if you knew you're eligible, what did you have to do? You had to put the paperwork together and mail it. Now, if you know you're eligible, you can't do that. Why? Because the government has to first select you or invite you, right? And we'll talk about that. So the first stage in the application process is called creating, uh, it's called creation of express entry profile. So what I want you guys to take out from this is profile or express entry profile, which is step number one, is not an application to Government of Canada. This is just expression of interest. So when you are going to be creating a profile or your friends will be doing that, um, note that you're not sending any documents to the government. They're not reviewing anything. They're not keeping anything. You're just entering the database from which the government can invite you. Make sense? So once you enter this database, that's when you have a chance for the government to pull you out of this database and let you submit an application for permanent residence. Whether they're going to pull you out of this database or invite you depends on your score, right? Um, this diagram shows uh, that the system of score fluctuation is very unpredictable. So Let's say when the system was launched, the cutoff score was very high. It was like 500. Then it started to go down. It's important. At some point, it went up. Then it went down. Right now, it went up again. It's, about, it's at about 452. Um, but we'll talk about predictions a bit later. So it's unpredictable, right? When you know that uh, it's unpredictable, you can make some suppositions. But you never can be sure that, let's say, tomorrow I'm going to be invited. So you have to do everything possible, in my opinion, to have the highest score, right? Because you never know when they're going to limit quotas, when they're going to change rules, when uh, more people will enter the pool who have really high scores, right? So that's why you should be prepared for the worst, just so that you do succeed and you're not left out. And we'll talk about how you can have the highest score as well. What does your score consist of? It consists of two parts. The first part is what you can control, is what you have pretty much right away. So most of you would be scoring out of 600. Um, the scores are located for age, education, work experience, and language test results. And I have a question for you guys. What do you think? Uh, it, here it says that you can take IELTS General or CELPIP. What is your opinion in terms of which test is easier? CELPIP. CELPIP, OK. That's what I hear lately, and I agree. Uh, but some people still prefer ALS General, whether because they've studied for it before or because they just don't like talking to computer. Because in CELPIP, you have to talk to computer. In ALS, you talk to real person. In ALS, you type. You don't handwrite. That's another thing I like about ALS more. To me, listening in ALS is easier. 
in, uh, sorry, in Selpiv. In Selpiv, to me, listening is easier. In IELTS, you have to listen to tape recorder, which could be far away with British accent, so a lot of people don't like that. But um, what I recommend is to try both tests, because some people still, they're just better fit for IELTS. Even though they've studied for CELPIP, they tried both, they're like, you know what, we like IELTS more. So try both and see where you're scoring better because they are slightly different. Uh, what about education? So some of you said that you have education outside Canada. So if you have, let's say, bachelor's degree outside Canada, does it mean that you automatically get points for it or no? Yes. So you need to, in order to get points for your outside Canada master's degree, bachelor's degree diploma, you have to have an official report that says your education is equivalent to bachelor, master's, and so on. So a designated organization has to assess your transcripts, assess your diplomas, and provide that report. That process can be easy, take a month, can be very long and difficult. That's why I always recommend to all of you to get started with this right away. Um, I've had cases when it dragged for six months because um, let's say WS requested something additional from university and they took forever to respond and WS took forever to assess it because it was something they haven't done before. That's why it's better to have that just sitting on the side and ready. The report is valid for five years so there's no reason for you to wait till last minute and then you're losing time because you didn't do it. You cannot do the first step without this report. So you cannot create profile if you don't have the results of the report. I mean, you can, but it's not going to give you points for it, so you're going to have very little points, right? Um, if you can see here in green, uh, 100 points is allocated for skill transferability factors. This is where a lot of people lose a lot of points just because they either didn't consider, let's say, foreign work experience, which they could have considered, or because their IELTS or CELPIP is not high enough. Um, Canada doesn't only look for people with, let's say, great education or great work experience. They're looking for people who have combination of different great things. So let's say if you have a combination of really high language results and two education credentials, there you go, 50 points, right? And so on. So at the end, I'll do a couple of case studies and you'll see how much this makes a difference and what you can do to score better at it. And at the bottom, I'm, um, it says that 600 points is allocated for nomination. We'll talk about that later. So basically, out of 1,200 points, most of you would be actually scoring out of 600. Not many people have the additional 600 points for nomination. Make sense? Any questions? All right, let's move on. So this next slide, uh, yeah. So this slide is about invitation to apply and what happens after. So as we talked about in the beginning, I'll sort of recap it again. Let's say you've entered the pool, and it shows that you have 430 points. What happens after? Once every two to three to four weeks, the government of Canada enters the pool and they, talk, they take people from the top and invite them. Now, this November, something big changed. I'll tell you what it is, and it potentially can impact a lot of you. Before November of 2017, if government entered the pool, they made it fair. So if they decided to invite 3,000 people and they stopped at somebody who has 430 points, they took everybody for who has 430 points. So, every, if, so if you saw a statistic, today the draw was for 430 and you had 430, you can rest assured that you're going to get that invitation given that your profile was created beforehand and the portal's functioning, you can see the 430 points on your portal, right? Now, they say, we're not going to do that anymore. They, what they've done is they've decided that we're only going to invite a set amount of people. So before, let's say, if they invited everybody with 430 points, they would say, they would post that today they invited, let's say, instead of 3,000, 3,100 something, right? Now, they say we're going to invite 3,000, and they invite 3,000. So what happens to people who had 430 points, right? There could have been a lot of them. So what do they do? They post a tie-breaking rule. So it took me a while to figure, it out, to figure out what it means. Tie-breaking rule means a date, um, a cutoff date for people who have the lowest score in terms of when they created the pro their profile. 
So the longer the, you wait to create the profile, the less chance you have to be invited. That wasn't the case before. Before, as long as your profile was in before the draw, you're good. Now you have to think about, I need to create it as soon as possible. Because if the tie-breaking rule was um, for the date that's, uh, which is uh, after you created the profile, you won't make it. Does that make sense? So they take only the oldest profiles for the people with the lowest score. Make sense? So even let's say you have, right now you have 400, you know you can score 406 points, let's say, right? You know it's not a lot, you're probably not going to be invited. In two months, you're, you're hitting one year work experience and you have a lot of points. I used to say, you know what, doesn't matter, wait till you have one year and create the profile now. No, create the profile now. Because they look at the date you created it. If you update it later, it doesn't matter, right? So the point of the story, things change. Now there's an urgency to create your profile. If today you guys learned that you're eligible and all you need is cell pip or, do you, or all you need is WAS, you should probably start working on it, right? Um, after you've been invited, now the application process begins. So after you're invited, you start uh, all the government forms, all the document checklists open up and you start filling out a lot of government forms like personal history, travel history, family history, address history, statutory questions, information about your employment, job offer, and so on and so forth. There's a lot, and you have 90 days to do it. So you should probably be working on gathering that information ahead of time. And uh, you have also this period to upload all the documents. So imagine if your employer got sick, or your employer is just very difficult to get a hold of, you're running over a risk of not making it in 90 days, right? So it's important to get started ahead of time. Even if you know you're not going to be invited for some time, you should be looking at all these things ahead of time. Um, how long does it take to process your application? I say two to six months is average. In the last couple of months, I'm getting like four or five weeks responses often. So they're starting to process it really fast. I got a lot of people who are processing four or five weeks, but at the same time, some files do sit for up to six months. And there's no explanation for it. Sometimes there is. Sometimes it's just because the, the file ended up in the hands of this officer who is too busy, right? So there's no guarantee, but I do see a lot of files, one, two months, one, three months, which is great. Longer than six months, very rare. I had two files out of probably like more than a hundred that are taking longer than six months and it's because the person uh, lived in like four different provinces and they have to, what the CAC tells me is like they're doing security back check, background checks for each province, that's why it's taking so long. Uh, normally it doesn't take this long. What were the lowest scores of candidates invited? So in 2015, when the program was launched, uh, the lowest scores for 50 only happened once. There was a couple of 453, the rest was pretty high. 2016 was the worst. Um, 430, 453 was invited only in January. After that, their score climbed up to 490, 480, 500, and a lot of people were waiting and waiting to be invited, and they went back home, or they had to become students again. It was, it was sort of a mess. Now, in the 2016, lib liberal government came to power, which was great. They introduced really great changes, and that caused the score to kind of go down. And they also introduced higher quotas. So they decided to invite more people. Conservative government was not inviting a lot of people. So who knows <laughs> what the next government is, right? So you guys should be prepared for the worst because I've had people back in 2015 who were just dragging their IELTS and they had to wait for a year to be invited because they should have just done IELTS a little bit earlier. All right? Uh, 2017 was great and that's because uh, the liberal government introduced those great changes. The score started to go down um, in the first quarter of the year, it reached 413 points. Now it's back higher because it's the end of the year. Um, the government, usually, the government introduces new quotas in the beginning of the year. So think about it, they've invited so many people in 2017, now they're starting to invite less. That's why the less people invite, the higher the score, right? 
I'm expecting in January for the score to go down. Right now it's 452. Just about like last month it was 433 or so. I'm hoping that in January it could, go, it could start going down towards 413 again. So maybe in March it'll <laughs> reach that, maybe in February, we don't know. But I, I am expecting for some good, good news, right? So again, if you know you could be eligible soon, uh, you should probably try to take IELTS or CELBIP during the Christmas break maybe, or like sometime in the next month. That would be a great idea. Now, how you can, how can you know that you're eligible for Express Entry or how can you know that you can start creating a profile? If you're not eligible, the system's gonna throw you out. You can't create a profile if you're not eligible yet. So let's say if you have zero work experience, you can't start. Or if you only have nine, 10 months, you can't start. Um, Express Entry is basically an umbrella for three immigration streams. Express Entry is not an immigration stream. Right? It's not an immigration program, it's more like a system of inviting people. Um, the programs for which you have to be eligible are called Federal Skilled Worker, Canadian Experience Class, and Federal Skilled Trades. I'm not going to talk about Federal Skilled Trades because it's very seldom that anyone's eligible for it. Even if they are, they're usually eligible for one of these two streams as well, and they, they apply under these two streams. So let's start with Federal Skilled Workers. Some of you told me that you have outside Canada work experience in education, and maybe you don't have one year work experience in Canada yet, but because you have the outside Canada work experience in education, you might already be eligible for this stream. What does this stream require? This stream requires you to score 67 out of 100 points on a special scale, and it requires you to show that you have money on your account. Uh, th this is called settlement funds. So if you're thinking about the stream and you're single, you should have 13, 000, close to $13,000 in your bank account. If you have a family, let's say you have a spouse, it's like 15 and a half thousand, and it goes up if you have kids. If you have that on your account and you scored 67 out of 100, you can already be in the pool. You can be in the express entry pool. Whether you're gonna be invited or not depends on your language results. And you'll see that later. So that's the first program. I'll give you an idea. If you have bachelor's degree from overseas, if you have preferably two, three years of work experience overseas, one might work if you have master's degree. And if you have really good language results and you're young, you'll be eligible for the stream. Um, we'll talk about it more when I'm doing the examples. Now, the second way you can be eligible is if you've gained one year high skilled work experience inside Canada. Now, I have a question for you. What does high skilled mean? Anyone knows? Any? Yes, NFC codes. Which ones? Yes, OAB, someone said it back. So high skilled means your occupation falls under NOC codes type OAOB. There is no simple definition, unfortunately, in terms of what that means. Type O is managerial occupations, type A is professionals, type B is uh, other high skilled occupations. This is something where you have to be very, very, very careful. So many times I have somebody who came to me and they're showing me their job descriptions and they're convinced this was high skilled. I look at it and I'm like, listen, this is not high skilled. You wasted like six months. You could have been looking for other jobs, but you just didn't do proper research and you were convinced that it's high skilled. I'll give an example. Let's say secretary, is that high skilled or receptionist? No. Legal secretary. Yes. Or if you're a receptionist and you do the duties of administrative assistant, is that high skilled? Yes, because what makes your job high skilled is the duties you do, not the job title. The subcategory administrative assistant is high skilled. So if you were doing, let's say, reports, you were going to employer meetings, taking the minutes, doing or ordering office supplies, even though you said the reception, nobody cares, you do the job of administrative assistant, and this is high skilled. Dental assistant, is this high skilled? No. But medical assistant is high skilled. 
<laughs> it looks like almost the same, right? Um, so there's a lot of jobs where when I say it, it sounds high skilled, but it's not. Or the other way around, it sounds low skilled, but it's high skilled, right? Any supervisor is high skilled. So if you worked at the clothing store, you're not, it's, this is not a high skill creation. If you became supervisor, it's high skilled. If you're a sales representative and you sell, I don't know, like something at the grocery store, whatever it is, low skilled. But if you sell like computer software equipment and you do some recommendations, follow ups, agreements, so on and so forth, that's high skilled, right? So it's very not straightforward. Unfortunately, you have to do, re you have to do the research. And some of you will ask, does my education have to match the work experience? There's no such rule. But there are occupations that require certain education, and you have to follow that rule, right? Usually type B occupations are very flexible. Um, that's where a lot of international students or young professionals would be working in. And uh, they don't require, s a lot of it don't require specific education or background. So you can pretty much go and get a job as a legal assistant, doesn't matter which field of studies you've had, right? Or administrative assistant or a supervisor and, and so on and so forth. Supervisors, usually it's great to show that you've had previous low-skilled experience in the field, but not necessarily. Um, so high-skilled work experience, that applies to both streams. So you, even if you're a federal-skilled worker, you cannot be applying if you were working as a sales assistant back home, right? So express entry requires high skilled work experience. Uh, now let's talk about the types of work experience. This is the most important part probably today and how you can prove your work experience. That's where probably a lot of you will have questions. So feel free to raise your hand, all right? So let's start with Canadian work experience. So think about you working in Canada and getting points for it. Don't think about foreign because outside Canada work experience is quite opposite. So let's talk about the rules that apply to Canadian work experience. First of all is the government of Canada requires you to gain 1,560 hours over 52 weeks period. 52 weeks is one year, 12 months, right? Um, the minimum of amount of hours average, I would say, is 30 hours a week. So basically, if you worked 30 hours a week for 52 weeks, you're going to have 15, 60 hours, and you're eligible. That's, that's the first thing. Um, the second great thing, and that's fairly new thing, it was introduced a couple of years ago, is the Government of Canada does not require for your work experience in Canada to be continuous. So if you worked for three months at one job, it's high skilled. Then you had a break and you, 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 let's say you left the job for whatever reason, you had a three months non-employment period, and then you found another job and you worked for nine months, you combine it and you're good to go. Before they required you to stick to one job for a year, which kind of was difficult for a lot of people. So this is a great thing. And another great thing, you can combine different high school jobs, which are either part-time or full-time. So let's say you had a part-time job for three months, 20 hours a week, and then later you got a full-time job for 40 hours a week for nine months. You're still gonna get your 15, 60 hours in 12 months. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? What about if you gained 15, 60 hours in nine months? Can you apply faster? So if you work 40 hours a week, it's gonna take you nine months to get 15, 60 hours. Can you apply or no? It's a good question. You can't. They do want you to show minimum 12 months employment. So if you gained more hours faster, it's, it's a great thing, but it's not gonna give you any privilege to apply faster. When you'll be creating your express entry profile, it'll still say you're ineligible if it hasn't been 12 months. Um, the experience cannot be self-employed. What does that mean? There's one rule that you guys have to know, and if you don't follow this rule, it doesn't matter how great your job was, how great of the letters employers give you, whether you paid taxes, if you don't follow this rule, this experience will not be accepted for Canadian experience points. And this rule is that you have to have what? It's there, T4. 
Can anyone tell me what is T for? Yes. Exactly. So if you are officially on a payroll with the company, <laughs> your official employee, then at the end of the tax year, the employer has to provide you a form called T4 form. And that T4 form shows how much taxes they deducted from each one, oh, sorry, over the whole year, how many provincial, federal taxes they deducted, how much CPP they deducted, how much EI they deducted. Usually they'll deduct it from every paycheck. Not usually, it's mandatory. So if you started working there every two weeks or every month, depending on your pay period, the employer should be giving you pay stubs. They don't always do that, but they still will be deducting taxes and that's okay. You can request a pay stub from them. But the question you can ask is, will you be deducting taxes from each one of my paychecks and will you give me a T4? If they say, mm, we're gonna give you T4A, does that work? T4A means you're self-employed. They de don't deduct all taxes. They give you some other form, doesn't work. They don't give you T4, you can't use these hours. You can still work at this job if you need the money, it's legal, but you can't use this for experience. The officer is gonna look at whether you have T4 on file, 100%, and in many cases they even send a request to CRA to verify that it's a legitimate T4. Oops, Chantal, sorry. Oh, it's back on, great. Sorry, I had a problems with the projector last week, so hopefully it goes well. Um, so, I've, when, let's say, the file is approved, I often requ uh, request notes to see what officer's reasoning was. So many times I see the officer saying, uh, T4 looks unprofessional, let me verify. Because some companies have, oh, what's that? Just, just go to, that wasn't even my screen, that's weird. Um, so sometimes companies provide some electronic T4, it looks kind of strange, which is okay. So then the officer goes and verifies it, or you can just do it randomly. You can just randomly pick on you and verify it. So you have to use legitimate, legitimate employment. You cannot backdate a T4, you cannot make, some, make up some pay stubs. It's very serious. If they send a request to CRA, you'll be in big trouble. Another thing that happens lately is um, they do random checks. So it's very, very important, in my opinion, who signs your employment letter. If it's some HR who's never seen you before, doesn't know what you do, but they have things in their system and they can answer all the questions clear, that's okay, right? So make sure, I usually recommend to get someone who knows you well, who knows what you do well, to sign the employment letter and has to be the person who is higher up, supervisor, manager, or your HR, right? Um, so it, it's, it's very serious. If I really, really warn you guys not to do anything fake. Unfortunately, I see that a lot. Someone tells me, you know, my friend has a company, he's gonna write something, blah, blah, blah. They have ways of figuring out and I've seen this happen. I've seen people lose their PR. I've seen people uh, being banned from Canada because of mis misrepresentation, just because they ask some friend to write a letter, uh, do fake pay stops. What happened is somehow officers figured out that something was fishy. They called the employer, interrogated him for an hour. They called the person, interrogated him for an hour, and then they just saw that it didn't match. The person didn't do the job, right? He's not gonna answer a lot of very like, picky questions, so be very careful. You have enough time, you have the right skills, you have the right tools, find the correct job, work for a year, and you'll be successful. It's not worth the risk, all right? Um, if you worked during studies, does that count? No. Uh, what if you had a paid co-op during studies, does that count? No. What if your co-op is after you graduated? and it's paid and high skilled. Does that count? Mm -hmm. So let's say you graduated, someone, someone offered you engineering internship, you get paid, you do all the engineering duties, why not? Just because it says intern or junior assistant or whatever, it doesn't mean you're not eligible. Make sense? What if you're offered a contract? 
the question is, are you going to get a T4? Some contracts don't give you T4. If it's a six-month contract, but you're getting the pay stubs, that just means employer's not sure if the project's going to be there in six months. But he's paying you as an employee in payroll, and that counts. After six months, if you uh, didn't get an extension of the contract, you can go find another job and then combine the hours. All right? Um, any, qu any other questions about Canadian work experience? Yeah. So the question is if the employer needs to have like a minimum revenue or minimum amount of people employed, not for this program. For provincial, certain provincial streams, yes, there are requirements for the employer to have minimum revenue and min minimum amount of people employed and so on and so forth. For express entry, no. It could be a startup company. As long as you're officially on payroll, it's an existing company that they can verify. Um, they can do a web search or uh, Industry Canada search and see it's a real company. That's what matters. All right. Any other questions about Canadian work experience before we move on? All right. Let's move on to outside Canada experience. So if you guys are planning to either apply as federal skilled worker, meaning you're going to be using federal uh, outside Canada work experience, or if you're planning to get extra points for foreign work experience, let's say you already have Canadian one, but you want extra points, then foreign work experience can give you a lot of extra points. In this case, you have to prove that you have foreign work experience. And it's very different in terms of how you prove it comparing to Canadian work experience. The one thing in common is you still have to have 15, 60 hours, but one year has to be continuous in the same occupation. So if you had um, jobs that were all seven, eight months, not gonna work even if you have like five jobs like this. So one of, your, one of your jobs has to be minimum 12 months long. Make sense? In the same occupation. Uh, so if, if you, let's say, were with one company and you were administrative assistant and then you became a manager, not gonna work, unfortunately. I know it's kind of strange, but they do want one occupation for a year minimum. Uh, it can be self-employed. So if you own the company overseas, you were a freelancer, you were a contractor, um, that's okay. Um, the thing is with foreign work experience, they're not requiring you to show any tax forms, which is great, right? Some countries don't have proper legal systems, they don't have proper taxation systems, so you're not gonna be punished just because you had work experience in that country. For foreign work experience, the main emphasis is on the reference what type of job duties you did, uh, who signed your letter, whether was it one year long, was it high skilled, and so on and so forth. Were you paid, right? The letter has to say that you were paid. You can't just use some volunteer work experience. Make sense? And outside Canada work experience can be obtained during studies. So if you had, let's say, five-year engineering program and last year was internship where you were paid, you can use that. And I've had cases like this, and it went okay. You have to be reasonable. Uh, I heard of a case where someone worked 40 hours a week and they studied full time. Uh, the officer started to doubt, request additional information, wasn't satisfied with it. So usually it's either like a year internship or you at least would be working a bit less. Let's say 30 hours a week. Or you could work even 20, 25 hours a week, but it just takes longer for you to get the hours, and that's okay. That's still considered one year as long as you got 15, 60 hours. Make sense? All right, so just, just to recap, if you're using points for Canadian work experience, it cannot be self-employed, cannot be obtained during studies. It uh, can be with breaks, so it doesn't have to be continuous, right? And you have to have a T4. For ISAT candidate, can be self-employed, can be obtained during studies, but one year has to be continuous. Any questions here? Okay, good. If you have questions later, feel free to raise your hand. So let's talk about how you guys can improve your score. So let's say you have 430 points and the draw is for 50, for 60, you don't know what to do. There are, there are a few ways you can improve your points. Um, the first, I would say, the most common way how you can improve your points is by retaking the language test. 
You can retake it as many times as you want, and you can just update the profile. You don't have to create a new profile. And often, just one point difference can mean so many extra points. And you'll see later. Sometimes, extra 100 points. Just one point difference, like even half point difference in IELTS. I'll show you an example. Um, so if you're currently studying or just starting to work, I always recommend, if you guys want to be successful, if you want to be invited, get an early start with your language tests. I know some of you say, you know, Marie, we have master's degree from Canada. Doesn't tell me anything. I have people with two bachelor's degrees from England, and they can't score higher than six in IELTS. It's just, it's a difficult test. Some people just get nervous at tests. Some people don't have the natural uh, sort of inclination for languages, right? They're more technical. So get an early start with it. Have that test written early so that you know you have enough score. You don't have to retake it last minute. You don't want to be in a situation where the draw was great and you just needed to have half point more and then the score went up and you're out of luck. Um, if you have a spouse, um, your spouse should do education credentials assessment as well as you because that gives you extra points. So what happens is if you have a spouse, the points distribute in a different way. So let's say if you're single, the maximum points for education is 140. If you have a spouse, I think it's like 130 goes to you and 20 go and 10 goes, yeah, 130 goes to you and 10 goes to your spouse. So because your spouse didn't do credential assessment, you'll be losing nine, eight points. Could be not significant, could be crucial points for you. Um, you let's say you have 425 points of one year work experience in Canada and you're not being invited and you keep working, you reach two years of work experience, all of a sudden you have 450 points and you'll be invited. So if you still have time on your work permit, extra year of work experience can make a big difference. If you're absolutely out of options, your uh, work permit expired, you're not invited, you can go home and work for a year. An extra one year foreign work experience will give you like extra 30 points, right? And then you're good to go. You can come back to Canada in like a year and a half. So extra work experience makes a lot of difference. Now let's talk about provincial nominee certificate. Um, Ontario to me actually is the best province for provincial nomination for those of you who have bachelor's degree overseas or in Canada. So let's say you're in Express Entry Pool, you have 402 points and you have bachelor's degree, you've done everything possible, your IELTS is the highest, all of your credential credentials are assessed and with 402 will you be invited? Probably not, right? Now, Ontario has a great option for people like this. Uh, right now, the Ontario, all of the Ontario quotas are closed because Ontario has a vacation in December, the whole month, so they don't operate in December. In January, they're gonna start opening their programs. Um, they do have limited quotas, but one of the great programs is called Human Capital Priorities for Express Entry applicants. So provinces have Express Entry quotas and non-Express Entry um, programs, which are federal provincial programs, they're not express entry. Um, if you have 400 points minimum and bachelor's degree, once Ontario opens their quota, they can invite you directly into the pool and then you can submit a separate huge application to Ontario. After Ontario reviews it and approves it, they'll give you 600 points directly to your profile. Right? That's good to know for anyone because, again, we never know what's going to happen in the pool, right? You might be sitting here thinking, hmm, I have 450 points, I'll be fine. But then when you're applying, the cutoff is 490, right? Anything's possible, then this option of entire program will be sort of your saving option, right? Any questions about this? Good. Um, so that's a great way to obtain extra points. 600 points obviously is going to guarantee that you're going to be invited and you proceed with the express entry procedure. Does anyone have questions about LMIA job offers? Again, this, yeah. this job offer also, does it require doing a certain formats like 
coming <coughs> early at the person will be employed or certain roles and responsibilities need to be in detail. So what is El Maya Job Offer? El Maya Job Offer gives you 50 points, which often is a good amount of points. But it's not just a simple job offer letter. It's a very, very complex procedure that employer has to undergo. And a lot of employers don't agree to do it. I'll, ex I'll tell you why. Um, employer has to get LMA approval. So it's called Labor Market Impact Assessment Approval from Service Canada. So basically, Service Canada has to determine that your employment is not going to impact employment of permanent residents and Canadians, and that your employer is a legitimate person who has enough money to pay you. They're going to ask for this much of their accounting documents. Do employers want to share that? Probably not. They're going to ask your employer to fill out complicated, like, 20-page forms. They're going to ask your employer to advertise in, like, a lot of different places, one of which is Job Bank, which requires, like, really strict rules in terms of registration. It's a really long, complicated procedure just to register there for the employer. So it's very long very bureaucratic, very annoying. <laughs> so if this is your last resort and the employer is willing to support you, you can, discover, you, can, you can sort of like inquire about this option. Usually employers are not successful if they apply themselves just because there's so many different rules about median wages for the occupation, median wages for the province, uh, advertisement requirements, uh, the forms keep changing. Um, usually they do hire somebody to work on that. Um, I don't like these applications, so I don't do them. But my company has a consultant who deals a lot with it, and she's great. She, before she starts, she will actually go to your employer, sit down with him, show him everything, explain everything, and if the employer says yes, then she'll start. That getting that 50 points is it only through LMIA if, if somebody comes to ICT, intercompany transfer? Sorry, yeah, so we were talking about LMIA job offer. You're right. Now that the new changes come, came to force, LMA exam job offers also give you 50 points. So if you're intercompany transferee, you, you were working for a corporation overseas, now you're transferred to Canadian branch, you get the 50 points just because you have that job offer. It's not complicated to get that. If you have young professionals visa, if you have uh, some French visa, there's a lot of exemptions. They usually are specific for certain countries or for certain unique situations. So if you're on an open work permit, you don't have those points. If your work permit is employer specific, then chances are you have the 50 points. Or if you want to obtain 50 points, usually you have to have LMI, all of my exam job offer. Mm -hmm. But that ICT to ICT, if somebody comes working for the same company from yeah. different country to here, yeah. does that offer letter require certain format like job description yes. details yes. and all these stuff? Yes, and usually, uh, not usually, your employer is required to pay $230 and fill out a special portal form, but it's nothing compared to LMA. It's so much easier. It's maybe like a couple hours of work versus LMA is like many, many hours of work. Any questions about that? If you are running out of your work permit and you know you can't be eligible without extra working time in Canada, you might want to talk to your employer and see if he'll support you. I know I kind of scared you. Uh, it, it's not always that bad and complicated. Some occupations have faster processing times. They have easier requirements for LMAs. So it li really differs. There's so many different types of LMAs. But uh, if this is your option, you can contact, uh, I recommend for you to contact Magda. Um, you can call our office, Chantal will connect you with her. She's great. She'll talk to your employer for free. She'll first call him for free, and then we'll, she'll arrange other steps. Because if on the phone he says no, then probably no. A lot of employers say, yes, we're going to help you. What do you need? We need you to get your uh, permanent residence. And when she starts asking them questions, they're like, oh, no, thank you. <laughs> All right? Okay, so let's move to, uh, we're almost done. So this slide is very important. Remember I told you guys that sometimes just one point difference in language can give you extra 100 points. So this is what I call golden score. This is for IELTS. So seven in speaking, eight in listening, seven in reading, and seven in writing um, is CLB9, Canadian Language Benchmark mine, 9, CELPIP, is equivalent to Canadian language benchmark. So that would be 9 out of 12 in CELPIP. So if you have 9 out of 12 in CELPIP or 8 in listening, the rest 7 in IELTS, 
you can kind of breathe out and know that you probably definitely have good chances, almost always. Um, I'll show you now how that impacts you. So try to remember CLB9, when I see CLB9, that's IELTS 8 listening, 777, or CELPIP9, right? Th these are the examples that I was talking about. So let's take a hypothetical applicant. Uh, let's suppose his name is John Smith. He's 27 years old, meaning that he has top points for age, 110, which is great. And then he has master's degree from UK. He assessed it, so he has 135 points for education out of 140, which is great. And now he has three years of foreign work experience, but he doesn't have any experience in Canada. Also, John Smith didn't bother studying much for IELTS. He didn't get really great results, so he got only CLB 7, 8. So he got, let's say, 6.5 speaking, listening 6, writing 6, reading 6. This is not the highest. Um, but that's actually a, a start for a lot of people, even those who graduated in Canada. I often see these kind of IELTS results. Hopefully a lot of you have better, but without preparation, you might end up here, unless you have great language abilities or maybe you're a humanities student, right? Um, with CLB 7-8, his language scores very little. It's only 74 out of 136 points. It's not a lot. Uh, now, because he has foreign education, sorry, foreign work experience, and he has great education, he has 25, remember I talked about the combination of factors, 100 points, so skill transferability, 100 points. So out of those 100 points, he only has 50, because his language is not good. So for a combination of master's education to lang and CLB7 language, he has only 25 points. If only he had better language, he could score 50 here. And then for a combination of three years of foreign work experience and CLB, minimum CLB 7, 8 language, he has also 25 points. So his total score is 369. Is that going to be enough? No. Now, John Smith realized that he just needs CLB 9. That's all he needs. He just needs to study, retake the test. He got now 8 in listening and 777. That automatically gave him extra 50 points in the skill transferability section. Plus, he got extra 50 points because he just scored high in the language abilities. So the score difference is 100 points. What happens if in listening, he has 7.5? He's going to lose 50 points here. And that's it, pointless. Just one, like half a point, that's it. Even if he has the rest nine, doesn't matter. If one of sorry, if one of these is just half point lower, you lose automatically fifty points plus some additional points. So you won't even have four hundred. You'll have less than four hundred points. You you won't have, you're not even eligible for the provincial nomination with this, right? So that's for those who don't have Canadian work experience. Don't be scared. If you have Canadian work experience, it's easier. So let's say John Smith decided not to retake the test, but he decided to work in Canada for a year. Um, so again, his IELTS is still bad. It's only CLB 7-8, 6.5, 6, and 6, and 6. Uh, but now he got one year work experience. Sorry, I forgot to mention, I mean in Canada, right? So he got one year work experience in Canada. Now for Canadian work experience, he has extra 70 points. And the skill transferability points, where he lost 50, now he gained 50 here because of the work experience in Canada, right? So now he has extra 90 points because of that one year, even though his language is still bad. Now he has 459, will he be invited? Probably yes. If he had like seven, eight CLB here, he'll have like 520 or something. So really great, right? If he also studied in Canada for a year, that's additional 15 points. Does that make sense? So basically, either you have to have a combination of a lot of great things, and then there's less emphasis on your language, but still you might need it, right? So you should try to aim for good language results. Or you have to have top language. Another situation where you really have to have top language is when you only have two-year college in Canada. So let's say you don't have any other education. You only have two-year college inside Canada. And you worked for a year, obviously, you have to, do, you have to get one year work experience. In this case, with, you need to have CLB9. 
with one year in CLB9, you're going to have 425 points. Might not be enough, but if you have CLB10, so IELTS 10, sorry, CELPIP 10 out of 12, then you have 437, and 437, the whole of last month, people with the score were invited. Right now, it's a little bad because it's the end of the year. Definitely in January, people with 437 will be invited. Right? What if the situation is really bad all of a sudden? Then you need to get one more year of work experience and you'll have 450 or up to 462, even though you only have two year education in Canada. All right, so maybe you have friends like this and you can tell them this. Or maybe some of you are in this situation. All right, so let's, any questions about these slides? No? I'm not adding any 50 points for job offers here, any provincial nominations. So it's a very, very typical scenarios where people don't have LMA job offers, LMA exam job offers, and they don't have nominations. And young people, right? If you are, I would say, over 36, 37, you might be looking at getting this plus high language. Then your age is not going to impact you, right? Okay, so. This is the last slide, we're wrapping up. This slide is about what happens or what you need to do in order to prevent refusals or how you can make sure the application is successful. So number one reason for refusal is if you made an error. If you determine your NOC code wrong or your job title is too vague and job description is too vague, you might be refused. Um, if there's lack of clarity if the company is, I would say, if things are too sketchy in your application, like very unprofessional, the company doesn't have a website, some kind of strange industry, doesn't, it's not even clear what exactly you do. They can start investigating you, they can start doubting the genuinity of your experience. If the employer performs poorly on the interview, you'll be refused. Even though you were kind of doing the right thing, right? So it's very important that things in your application are very professional. Um, the second ref refusal reason, unfortunately, it does happen, and it does happen, I can't say frequently, but I see it quite often. So I see it probably a few times a year for sure, when the immigration officer makes an error. They're not perfect people, think about it. They have large quotas, somebody can be new, somebody can misinterpret something in the regulations or misunderstand something in your application. I had a case where officer canceled the application because he said that I did not provide him an original police certificate. I only provided a translation. But what I provided was the original certificate. There was no need for translation the certificate was in English, but he is used to seeing uh, certificates in the original language for that country, but some consulates provide it right away in English. So he thought the stamp was the translator stamp. And I was like, listen, you guys just look carefully. It's there, right? So unfortunate things do happen even if you do everything perfect. Most of the time officers make an error because your application was not well organized. Think about it, if a very, very important document is sitting somewhere in a file that has 100 pages, which is typical, you might be submitting files with 100 pages because there's too many pay stubs or contracts or so on and so forth. And some important document, somewhere, important document somewhere at the end or in the middle and they just missed it. Happens. Your, your application has to be very well organized. It has to be in the order of priority. Um, when you're going to the document checklist, it's not going to be comprehensive. It's not going to spell out each document you need to provide. It has very limited space, but the guide will tell you which documents you need. So don't go just by those question marks in the checklist. Read the guide. The guide will tell you, let's say you have some unique situation, what you need to do in this case. The guide covers almost everything, not everything. Some things you just, you just let's say I know them because I have the experience or I've seen too many cases, I tried something, right? But the guide is very helpful. I always have to refer to it just to see if they changed anything because sometimes they change something small in the guide. Let's say recently they changed that, they changed the rule that officer, um, it used to be that officer has to request the medical exam or the certificate if it's missing or if it's um, 
unclear or if it's not in color, now the guide lets the officers cancel your application or refuse your application. If you didn't explain why the post certificate is delayed, that you already ordered it, that you provided proof that you ordered it, if you didn't do this, he can just cancel it. You wasted time, you might have lost your bridging work permit because of it. So you have to be very careful, you have to know which things are mandatory and which things you can ask them to request from you later. Most of the stuff now has to be in right away. Or there has to be really significant explanation, usually it's plus certificates, the rest has to be there. Let's say the birth certificate for your child wasn't there, they'll cancel. Before they would just request it, they'd be nice to you. <laughs> now, no. So they're trying to make it kind of clear, fast, they don't allow for any errors. Uh, someone recently came to, came to me and they said, Maria, my friend told me that my police certificate is valid. It was expired, the person got refused, right? So you have to be very careful, you have to know all the, all the rules for expiry dates of your documents and things and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, what do I do to avoid the errors of immigration officer? I already told you, I make sure the file is organized, everything's in order priority. I also write a very, very strong cover letter which explains according to which regulations you're eligible. How do you support all of your points with which documents? Where can the officer find it? What's unique about your case? Which police certificates you provided and why? Is there anything in your travel history that you need to explain? so that the officer doesn't doubt maybe you should have had a police certificate for this country or not, right? So there's a lot of details that you have to explain. Uh, you might be lucky and not explain it and the officer requests you something from you or you might be not lucky, all right? Um, and just kind of a little personal advice to you guys, um, because the government can change any time, if today you learn that you're already eligible, I wouldn't wait. Um, so the next point is, if immigration laws or regulations have changed, you might miss your chance. So in 2013, the government introduced a rule that all administrative assistants, medical assistants, legal assistants, chefs, supervisors in the restaurant industry cannot apply. They limited uh, high-skilled occupations. So I've, I've, I've seen people who worked a whole year as a medical assistant, and that's it. Now, in 2015, they removed this rule, and these people still didn't know. They thought they can't apply. They could have applied and had their status, but they're like, oh, really? You know, we didn't even know. So you have to watch for these things. Anytime they can limit your occupation, and you'll be out of luck especially type B occupations. I feel a lot more safe about type A occupations or type O occupations. Type B occupations are always on that borderline. So if you know you're eligible, don't waste your time. If you know you have one year work experience, there's no need for you to work for a year and a half to to, so that the officer thinks you're great, no. If you meet the requirement of one year, you should be applying. Um, the last very, very important reason for refusal it's called inadmissibility. Um, so let's talk about medical criminal issues. Obviously, if you have criminal charges, you can't apply. Don't do drinking and driving, because that can impact you. Uh, if you, you or your family members have medical problems that cause too much burden for Canadian healthcare system, free healthcare system, the officers can refuse you. If your family member has it, unfortunately, the whole family becomes inadmissible. That's an unfortunate rule. Hopefully none of you will have that. And the last most important thing. So I have a question for you guys. If today your work permit expires and you have submitted your PR application today, you did everything on time, you submitted it today, but your work permit expires, what do you do? Can you just stay in Canada because you applied for PR? Yes, so you can't, some people think that because they applied for permanent residence, that gives them implied status, meaning they can just wait inside Canada, no. And I've seen people who were refused. They came to me like, Maria, why did I get refused? 
well because you should have maintained valid status if you lose status there's permanent residence and there's temporary residence temporary residence is study permit work permit visitor record visitor record is when you're just a visitor